Hello, hello. Okay. This is cool. All right, cool. So my name is Jerry Ellsworth. Um, uh, I was invited to come out and talk, and uh, I had, you know, a lot of choices about um, subjects I wanted to talk about. But I thought since it was a security conference and a demo coding party, you know, I should choose something that's kind of an interest to both. And FPGAs happen to be, you know, widely used in routers and security and, you know, even more applications. And then for demo coding, you know, it's kind of a perverted thing to make a demo in pure hardware. So anyway, a little bit about me. I'm a little strange, you know, I've, ever since I was young, I used to get in trouble with the law and burn things. I'm a natural pyro and play roller derby for uh, fun and take apart toys and turn them into animatronic uh, Commodore 64 controlled, uh, you know, things. Um, when I was a teenager, I got into racing cars and fabricating race car chassis. So uh, I have a little bit of a mechanical background too. Did that for about four years. Ended up dropping out of high school because uh, well, I was making so much money racing cars and building these chassis and school sucked. So I did that for about four years, and then I got into, um, I owned a chain of computer stores. I started with one store, and it grew, grew into five stores eventually, and I started making pretty good money doing that, and, you know, I quit racing, and, and then all of a sudden the entire computer store market fell apart when, uh, uh, you know, e-machines came out with, like, $399 machines, so, so I could no longer, you know, pay my employees, and so... You know, I decided to do something kind of crazy. I decided to teach myself chip design. And at this time, CPLDs and FPGAs were, um, you know, hitting the market at a price that, you know, a novice could get them and actually start doing, you know, interesting projects with them. Um, so I locked myself in a room for about a year, year and a half, started uh, coding in VHDL and schematics and taught myself how to um, program FPGAs. And then I jumped right out and, you know, tried to convince these uh, companies that uh, they should hire me to do their, you know, half a million dollar uh, mask sets for their, um, for their chips, which, you know, not too many takers on that. Actually, my first job doing chip design, I got $12 per hour. And... Uh, <laughs> Actually, I thought I did a very good job for them, and when I moved on to my next job, I used them as reference, and they called up, and they uh, gave me a negative review. <laughs> but, yeah, I ate a lot of ramen noodles in those days, uh, learning chip design. But. So I guess my, big, my first big break was when I was hired to design the Commodore 64 in a joystick. So, you know, this is the... I guess this is, okay. <laughs> I also, I got doing a, a lot of toys and designing uh, Gatorades for toys. Um, I did, uh, the C64 joystick sold like a half a million or more, but I did some less uh, exciting titles like, you know, Rescue Me Pets. Um, it's kind of interesting looking at the reviews that this uh, toy got. Um, some guy wrote, I bought this for my five-year-old son. He started crying and asking me if it had an off button, which it didn't. <laughs> uh, Brat's laptop thing here and this home arcade machine for people that are only about three and a half feet tall. <laughs> it didn't sell well either, and I think some of its reviews were, you know, this thing is utter rubbish. But actually, you know, the gameplay was pretty good. And it was accurate to the Williams games, but the the uh, form factor that the toy company chose was really, really too small. So FPGAs, they stand for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. These uh, chips are essentially you know, a way to emulate what a, a full custom ASIC um, would be. Uh, they come in different ranges. They have, you know, from just a handful of gates all the way up to millions of gates where you can simulate, you know, very large ASICs in them. 
They come in different speed range and power grades. You know, there's ones that can work in your cell phone and just, you know, sip the electricity, and then there's ones that, you know, you can cook an egg on, but they're blindingly fast. Um, there's types that you can program them once, and they're always programmed. There's types that are reprogrammable, kind of like flash microcontrollers. And then there's ones that are reconfigurable at runtime, so you can constantly update them and uh, put new cores into them to uh, repurpose them. You know, out in the field, for instance, if you have an update to a router or something, you can do it. Uh, another nice thing about FPGAs is they, they have all kinds of uh, I.O., so you can hook to USB or PCI Express. They're usually on the cutting edge of, you know, the latest you know, interfaces that are out there. And uh, today my demo is going to be on uh, this board. This was actually my, my reference design that I designed back in like 2002 or 2003. It contains two FPGAs, um, a very small one right here, which my entire demo is going to be based around this one FPGA. Then there's one that's about 10 times as big over here. Um, I built this um, circuit board originally as kind of a demonstration of what I could do so I could get a job. So, you know, when I went in and said, well, I've never been to school, you know, hire me, you know, here's what I can do. And I'd slap this down and I'd show examples of what it would do. You know, so this has VGA output on it. It has um, fast page memory interface for old 72 pin SIMs on it. It's got an SD RAM interface on it here if you want to do... Uh, um, 133 megahertz SD RAM, two IDE ports on it, and a compact flash running in true IDE mode, which I'll be using um, the compact flash from my demo to load music off of it in uh, MIDI format. Um, has a slot if you're a, a musician and level chip music, it's got a slot for two SID chips on there, the old Commodore 64 SIDs. Yes, I love that kind of music. So that had to go on there. It has an audio codec down in here that can also feed through the SIDs or go around the SIDs to accompany or be filtered by the SIDs. It has a PCI slot so you can, uh, you know, talk to PCI devices on it, you know, if you write a core, of course. Um, it has a 658-16 CPU, which is not installed. I'm not using any CPU today to do this and a few others, and some audio out, and some parallel port, and a PS2 keyboard, lots of little peripherals on here. Uh, MFM floppy interface if you want to hook up your old five and a quarter drive. So the basic structure in an FPGA is the logic cell. The FPGAs, like I said, they had these, these logic cells that can have a, a handful of these guys, or they can have a whole bunch of them, depending on the, the size, speed, and cost. So for combinatorial functions, the, the base of the, um, the logic cell is a four input lookup table or equivalent. Um, so you can have four terms coming into this lookup table and you can have one output. So you can do various you know, combinatorial functions. Then you have some routing where you can exit out of the logic cell combinatorially or you can feed into a storage register to latch your data. And there's some other routing too where you can go straight into the register. So it's a pretty flexible cell. You can emulate any circuit in an FPGA with this structure. So a lookup table, you can um, do combinatorial functions such as this. This is a schematic of uh, a MUX. So you have two inputs and you have a select line. And here's the actual and 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 or and XOR gates, all the stuff that uh, you, know, you use to build. So as long as it can fit within four inputs, you can do it in a, in a, an, in a logic cell. Otherwise, you have to start cascading logic cells. Also, inside of the uh, logic cells, a flip-flop. A flip-flop is a um, storage unit. You can either have it uh, store on every single rising edge of the clock that comes into it, which is a you know, repetitive clock. I'll get into clocks a little bit later. It has a data input, and you can store, you know, one bit at a time in there. Now, this is, these guys here are logic cells. So, they have local routing within um, the FPGAs. Almost every FPGA vendor has um, different arrangements where they'll have 
groups of logic cells where they can talk to each other very rapidly and quickly. So you can do counters, arithmetic, very rapidly. There's also some carry chains between here for arithmetic and cascades if you want to do very large functions. Now you start looking at the bigger um, view of the chip itself. Here's these groups of, in this case, um, 16 logic cells that have their local routing. Now there's global routing. These, you know, big, it doesn't come across on monitor, but these are individual wires running all over the chip. So you can take a, a logic cell over here, make a function in it, you know, hook it to some logic cell at the far corner of the chip. Yeah. And also, there's I.O. pads on here that allow you to get data in and out of the FPGAs. Um, another thing that many FPGAs have, but not all of them, is blocks of RAM. So you might have you know, 64K bits or some certain amount of, of block RAMs that you can use, could, can be configured as... Actually, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, and also, sometimes they'll put um, uh, dedicated arithmetic you know, units in there, like high-speed multipliers, max. So uh, let's talk really quickly about getting signals in and out of the chip. Yeah, you know, I, I know it's. I, we'd have to be here all weekend to, uh, you know, fully explain hardware and how FPGAs work. But you know, I'll try to go over some basics here of, you know, how an I/O pin is. So on this schematic, this is a pin. This corresponds to a physical metal connection that leaves this little chip and hits the circuit board, and then you know talks to the outside world. You often have a tri-state buffer. This buffer has an input that you can control whether this pin is an output or an input. So if you wanted to read something from this, this pin from the outside world, like a push button or a status of some you know, transducer or whatever, you would tri-state this, which does not allow any current to flow or be sourced or synced through this. So you now read from the output. If you want to drive out on this pin, you enable the signal, which allows you to drive signals out. For instance, you could hook an LED to this. If you hooked an LED to a VCC through, through down, hooked it to the pin, and then you tied the input to this tri-state to a zero, you could enable the tri-state and you could turn the LED on or off. You know, depending on the state of this tri-state. Um, logic levels, when I talk about logic levels, that talks about a zero is when the pin is grounded, and a one is when the signal is at VCC or the, uh, the voltage that the chip is running at, or the I.O. voltage. You know, often it's 3.3 volts or 5 volts if some older devices. Well, here's a good example. I can talk about clocks right here. Now, a clock is what you think, like a tick-tock on a clock. It's a constant repetitive signal that comes into the chip that everything is synchronized to. So you can see right here is clock. There's these rising edges, you know, that go by. And you use that for all synchronization. I mean, you know, when you hear about a Pentium chip running at a gigahertz, you have a clock somewhere running around in that chip that's toggling up and down at a gigahertz. Now, the design flow is very similar to software, but there's some some gotchas in it. You know, you have your normal design entry, which is kind of text-based. You write in a language. Then you go to synthesis, which is kind of equivalent to a compile. So synthesis takes this human-readable language and turns it into gates, all these AND and OR and XOR gates that you see. The next is where it gets a little bit different from software flows. You get into place and route, where you actually take these these gates that have been synthesized, and you map them to the actual FPGA logic cells. Um, once you place them route, you can start doing simulations to see if the circuit that you designed is actually what you want. Um, you know, on the previous slide, there was a picture of, of a simulation where I showed the, the clock. And then finally, you can do some timing analysis to make sure it runs the speed that you expect. If you Design a, a design, design a device and you feed it a clock that's too fast and you don't meet timing, it's not going to function the way you expect. Or it may function for a while and then when you hit a certain edge case, it'll die on you. 
again. So uh, another form of uh, entry is schematic entry. You've seen a couple of these already in other slides, but you can actually go into tools, which are readily available from the FPGA vendors, and drop down gates and flip-flops and you know, high-level functions that you want. You draw, draw wires to pins, so this is an input pin. You draw a wire and then you have a storage register and here's the clock and you know, there's the output. But most uh, designs these days, since the chips are getting bigger and more complicated, um, most designs have migrated to Verilog or VHDL. And this is a very similar to like C language. It has similar constructs. So you can make constructs like if signal foo and you know, signal bar, then do this certain you know, function, which gets synthesized into gates. Um, Verilog is very close to C. I've been told VHDL is very close to Pascal. And ABLE is very crude. It's probably equivalent to um, assembly language. Now, combinatorial logic, we go back to this, um, this MUX setup. So combinatorial logic flows at the rate of the gate delay. So each of these gates have a certain amount of time it takes for a signal to propagate through them. So the faster your gates, the faster your overall design can be. So for instance, signal A here has to propagate through two levels of logic. Signal B, in this case, has to go through many more levels of logic. You know, we have an inverter there. So you've got to actually watch this in your designs. You can write these, um, these designs in this high-level language, but you better be aware of what's happening on the bottom or on the, the synthesis side, or your, your device won't run at speed. The, the next type of logic is sequential logic. This is where your flip-flops come in. These are storage elements. They come in uh, basically two flavors. There's ones that on every clock tick, they sample the data input, and then some minuscule time later, this is the delay of the, the actual flip-flop, the signal pops out the backside. So this is a way that you can take a signal from combinatorial, which is slowly propagating through and restore it and get it back onto a clock edge so that you can control it again. Um, they also make flavors of these with an enable on them so that you can toggle an enable bit and you can sample the data and you can hold it. You know, a lot of you are probably familiar with registers in CPUs or in systems where you, know, you write to a register and it holds this value. So essentially what you have is a bunch of these and you latch your value into it and it just holds them constant on the backside. Now these, these flip-flops can either be rising edge or falling edge um, triggered. For instance, this one's a rising edge. You can see that I have a transition on the rising edge here. It samples it later. But if, if I make a transition any time away from the rising edge, it will miss this, uh, oh, it, right here, I'm sorry you will miss the, uh, the event and it won't propagate through. So it's very critical that you get um, um, your combinatorial logic so it's fast enough. Now the big, big difference on this, uh, on FPGAs versus CPUs is you can be concurrent. You can have as much logic running as parallel, in parallel as you want and you can merge it later. You know, we're starting to see multi-core CPUs these days but they don't even touch the amount of concurrent logic that you can do. For instance, in this scenario, I have uh, three separate pipeline stages. They're all running. So there's some function happening in here on a rising edge, and then something here and something here. And you have to be careful to merge all these paths so all the data arrives at the correct time when you do a merge and you want some relevant output. So that's pretty key. Um, the memories inside the uh, FPGAs, you can have, you know, kind of conventional memories with, you know, your data input, your write enable, your addresses, and then you have a read address on some of them. So they come in different flavors. You can have ROM only. You can have them pre-programmed at runtime, you know, with some code or, for instance, I have a font in my, my demo. Uh, or you can have them write 
There's also some really nifty like dual port RAMs where you can be reading and writing simultaneously. I already went over this with the now with Verilog and schematic, all these, these entries, you can actually have hierarchy in your design. So you can design modules, reuse them, and, or, and you can structure them in a hierarchical way so it makes sense. You know, for instance, here I have a module called VGA Gen, generates VGA signals. It has a horizontal and vertical counter in it, outputs horizontal and vertical sync pulses that leave the chip and go to the monitor. Then I have the horizontal and vertical counters that go out and get used all over in the chip to do video effects within. Um, so hierarchy is pretty important in the design, reuse, and replication. Oh, here's uh, a slide's actually a little bit out of order, but this um, is an example of uh, how you can pipeline to um, get higher and higher speed. So in this case, we've got two XOR gates. We've just cascaded them. So the, the data comes in, it gets XOR'd a few times, and the, the speed that this data can propagate through here is 150 megahertz. But if you can tolerate the, the delay, you can put flip-flops in here and recapture the data on every clock edge. So for, in three clocks, you would get an equivalent result, but it would run at 420 megahertz. You, know, you hear about you know, pipeline stages and CPUs. This is exactly how it works. They, they work on making deeper and deeper pipeline stages and doing smaller and smaller amounts of work between each pipeline stage. You know, the downside is if you have any kind of feedback that comes from the result of this or any kind of, you know, if you put the wrong data down here and you have to flush it, you're going to have to pay the penalty of flushing this pipeline. Here's an example of a really bad um, design practice. You know, since it's very much like C, you can do things like data A times data B. You know, that's, that's legal and it will do something. But if you look at on the simulation here, this is in time, the, um, here's where I, I initiated the multiply. I wanted to multiply FF by AA. You can see that it doesn't resolve for three clock cycles. Yeah, so that's not so good. So in turn, you would probably want to pipeline this multiply or make, you know, make a better decision. Actually, this type of multiply is very huge, too. It's trying to do it all in one, one cycle. You know, if you have enough time in your circuit that you're designing, you might want to try to do you know, bit serial or word serial multiplies. Or if you have to have fully pipelined, you can do a fully pipeline multiply. Um, uh, another thing about equivalent circuits, you can have equivalent circuits that have the same pipeline delay in them, yet use quite a bit different um, amounts of logic. For instance, here's some Verilog, and this is what it makes. A two-input MUX that selects between two signals, and I have a capture register here that's going to capture the, um, the result of this selection. So this is, allows for a very fast... Um, this is a minimalistic um, size. This is probably the smallest you can do this, this function in. And this allows for a very good setup time here to your next piece of logic. You can actually bury a lot more logic on the back side of this to your next pipeline stage. But if you find that your signals that are feeding this are far too slow, you can make an equivalent circuit that looks like this. First, you register all the inputs and then you run them through the MUX. It takes much more hardware, but now it's time shifted this. You've stolen some time from the previous stage, and you've moved it into this next stage. Now you can't drive as much out of this for delay. Is everyone uh, glazing over on all this? This is... No, not at all. Go ahead. It's okay? You can stop me and ask questions, too. If, uh, I'm almost to the good part, the, the demo. So in this demo, um, I didn't want to use any CPU, so I, I did all state machines. Um, this is a little snippet. This isn't the full state machine. But this is an example of you know, how you can make a state machine. This is part of a, a word serial multiplier that I made. I didn't want to burn up 
all this precious space in my FPGA with a multiplier on audio because audio is so slow. You know, I could take all the time in the world to multiply it. So as you can see here, I have an idle state. And I have an event that comes in that says, I'm ready for you to multiply this audio sample. You know, and it goes from this state to this state, this state, this state. And here's a graphical representation. So you can set up state machines to do you know, uh, tasks, sequential tasks that you would normally use the CPU for. Um, some of the stuff really crunches down very small, especially if you choose the encoding. Right here I've used some variables, but you can choose the type of encoding for the state machine. You can do binary encoding, you can do one hot, you can do all these different types of encoding, you know, for trade-offs for speed or, or area. All right, here, finally, what it took me hours to do is the demo. Let me switch the VGA over. Hopefully if you can bring the audio channel up. All right. All right, it's recognized my, uh, my VGA generator. So I'm generating 640 by 480. Um, let me tell you a little bit about this before I launch it. There's no video buffer in this. This is all rendered real time. Um, I wanted to grab some of the, the things that you would see in a historic um, the Commodore 64 demo, for instance, you know, you know, with scroll text and raster bars and a logo and some funky music playing and yeah. So here we go. <laughs> We got our scroll text going. I've got, since the um, VGA refresh rate is very close to the, uh, the audio frequency, I could easily generate a oscilloscope bars running up and down. Scroll text is all done in hardware, and I have a little table that has the, uh, the, um, the text in it. Uh, the raster bars, I have video planes on these, so they pass each other as they go up and down. You know, going at different rates. <laughs> Actually... Right. Yeah. Actually, my roommate... Um, this is a, a bug in here, this bouncing. <laughs> But my roommate liked it so much with the uh, bouncing in there, we decided to leave the, uh, the goof. <laughs> Which I, it's a, quite a bit of demo coding is by accident, so. So, I was hoping to get a star field in there, but I just didn't have time. <laughs> star. <laughs> uh, okay, see if this will grab my laptop. A couple more frames I'll talk about. Um, uh, what went into the demo, and then I'll quit boring you, and you can just ask me afterwards, you know, if you have specific questions. So we'll go back to the hierarchy. Um, the major blocks in this demo are the VGA generator, which generates the 640 by 480. It's made up of two counters and a couple comparators. So, um, and then we have the, the scrolly text, which is made up of some more comparators, so I can determine when on the screen I want them to, to launch. And it has some counters that count the, the eight lines of uh, scroll text, and then it has another counter that does the incremental scrolling at the, the vertical refresh rate. It's got a, a character ROM, which I used one of the block RAMs I was talking about, and I just went into WinHex and just typed in lame, or no, not lame, I'm sorry, I've, uh, I stole the Commodore 64 font ROM, I'm sorry, take that back. And then there's a parallel to um, serial shifter, so I shift out one bit and send it to my pixel priority logic, which generates all the video planes. The raster bar logic, I have two counters, they're up-down counters, they just go up to a certain value and then back down to another value at different rates. And I drug a signal out of one of the up-down counters so that I could control the priority. Um, and so, you know, when the raster bar goes up and then it starts coming down past the other one. Um, the, the neatest thing I, I had the most fun doing is I made a, 
a MIDI state machine that would read MIDI off of a compact flash and parse it and feed phase accumulators and envelope generators to generate the popcorn music. Um, I have to thank my roommate Ken Sumerall for uh, uh, hacking up the, uh, the MIDI file for me because my, I ended up my MIDI um, state machine wasn't 100% compatible with all the weirdness in, uh, in uh, MIDI, so it actually got lost when we tried to put our music in there yesterday. So uh, I have a white noise generator for the going on in the background, and then everything else is either enveloped or gated um, phase accumulators, which I, I have some. Well, here's some information about the VGA generation. So here's a horizontal counter. I had to uh, measure out these different times in clock ticks and count up. And when I reach those different clock ticks, you know, assert these signals correctly so that the LCD would read. Had to be pretty careful about that because I knew it the, L the projectors sometimes are a little finicky and want to have precise. And here's the vertical timing. It's much, much the same as the... Uh, to generate the, the analog video output, I use a resistor R2R ladder, which is very, very fast and cheap. So this gives you a pretty good linear step. So these hook to the pins of the FPGA here. And then you just feed it a binary value, and it gives you a you know, linear ramp. Whatever you feed it, it outputs right here. Which there's some more logic in there. I mean, some more circuitry for... Uh, emitter follower and stuff to drive the long cable out to there. Here's the phase accumulator for the audio. This is a, a sawtooth phase accumulator. The way it works is uh, you have an accumulator of a certain number of bits and you're taking your master clock, which happens to be 50 megahertz on this, and you feed it into this accumulator and there's an adder, and then there's a certain modulus that you add to it. Um, and the modulus gets added to it and you get, you get a stair step that goes up. I also support triangle and pulse width modulating um, in this, this design. So the, the, the triangle wave, what you do is you take the upper bits of your output of the wave out and you XOR all the lower bits and you get a, a nice, you know, gives you the kind of that fluty sound. Let's see. Um, I have a ADSR envelope generator in there where um, it takes node, in, node on, node off from the um, MIDI state machine parse just directly from the MIDI stream. So when uh, node on happens, it attacks to max volume and then decays down to the sustain level. And the sustain will go forever until you get a node off and then it decays out. And that's done with, you have a wave in, you actually hear some word serial multipliers here. And this is the wave out that gets mixed and sent out to the audio, the actual physical audio channel. And I guess the last big portion of this is uh, how you do the video planes. And this is a good example of priority um, logic in, in uh, Verilog. It's quite a bit different than C. Um, as you can see, there's red pixel here, red pixel. There's a lot of cases that you can get into where red pixel gets hit. But in C, Oh, I guess this isn't a good example. I take that back. <laughs> anyway, this will show that um, if you assign a value up here, for instance, red pixel gets assigned all one, but if you hit a case down here where red pixel gets assigned again, it will overwrite it. So you can generate priority here. So everything at the bottom has more priority than the stuff at the top. Like lame counter, I wanted that to be at the bottom. So... Uh, um, resources. I don't think I have a slide for that. Resource. Oh, man, I'm going to get flamed for having PowerPoint after the, our last speaker. Um, so resources. There's a lot of resources online. Um, a lot of boards you can go buy. You can still you can get the board that I designed from a guy in Germany that sells them. Um, there's lots of boards that have even bigger FPGAs on them. Um, there's lots of great books out there. One that I like is, or at least I learned on, it may be outdated these days, but 
uh, rapid pro prototyping for digital designs. It has a lot of uh, good examples. Um, not that I agree with everything in it. It uses a lot of synchronous resets, so avoid those. Um, yeah, and that's about it. Any questions? Yeah. Right, that's okay. Also schematics is a great way to go. By the way, that's how I learned. Um, having done electronics since I was a little kid, you know, I dealt with schematics, and all the tools from Z the free tools. I should mention free tools from Xilinx and Al Altera um, have schematic entry, and you know, as you go on, you'll probably find that you'll. Um, start migrating away from schematics except for at top levels. I still use a lot of schematics at top levels. I put pins on at the top level and I'll put the big blocks down. That way you can look at it and visually see how it works because a bunch of text like this is just, you know, it's... Can you, can you see um, the schematic output from a synthesizer? You can, yes. You can actually give a sanity check and I use that quite a bit in my everyday um, job is, you know, you synthesize something, you write a piece of code, and you think you know what it's going to do, and then you go look at the schematic generates, and you're like, oh my goodness, there's 10,000 flops in the way of what I wanted to do. I really messed up. So that's a, a good tool also, is to look at the schematics of what it's generating. You can also look at the fitter and see how it's fitting that logic that it's generated. So you go from entry to synthesis where it makes gates and then to fitting where it actually maps it to these logic cells that are going to emulate the gates. And you can often catch like really bonehead things in the um, fitter tool where it's like you have one gate at the far end of the chip and then you have another gate at the you know, other end of the chip you know, and there's this huge delay path between them. You know, if you just go in there and give the, the tool a little bit of hint like I really want this closer to the other gate. Yeah. Can you partition off uh, sections of the, of the array and then use different clock inputs for, for what different clock inputs? Yes, for that's uh, cross clock um, and uh, domain crossing is a little tricky. There's some great papers out there on how to have very low speed um, areas of the design which you might run at one megahertz like audio. You could run it at one megahertz. There's no need to burn extra gates trying to make it really fast which the tool will do if you have a really fast clock and you run everything at the fast clock, it's going to throw up more gates at it to try to, uh, you know, he'll use like a carry look ahead adder instead of a, a ripple adder or for a counter. So, yeah, that's, it's, it's a little tricky. It's hard to track down, too. If you don't cross those clock domains correctly with asynchronous FIFOs or gray encoding, you'll, you'll be chasing problems around. So, for a beginner, just do a flat, fully synchronous design, I reckon. I'd recommend. Uh, the FPGA that you used in this, uh, was it a multi-programmable one or a one-time programmable? This one was an SRAM based. It's actually, when I designed this board, I wanted it to be a general um, reconfigurable computer. So the way it functions is it comes up with the smallest FPGA gets configured off compact flash. And then it searches all the IDE drives, and it looks for bit files that can program the big FPGA on it. And uh, then the user goes through a menu and selects which bit file he wants to configure the big um, FPGA with. And uh, so you can reprogram it. You can even reprogram it you know, during runtime, which is, I haven't done a lot of that, but I'd like to do it someday. I think it'd be really cool you know, to uh, you know, constantly be reconfiguring. It, it's a little slow because uh, you have to, all these lookup tables have to be programmed in a serial fashion. So, you know, it's many microseconds to configure. Any other questions? Oh, wait. here, let's get someone down here. Uh, do you know of any FPGA vendors that release enough information to, to make uh, it possible to program with uh, an open source tool suite? Because I know that's a problem. I've heard that there's uh, Atmel and Xilinx have done that for university, but I don't, or they've released this, their bitstream information in university. 
I was actually talking to someone in the audience earlier today, I think it was Jake over here, about um, there was an interesting project at one of the universities where they took an FPGA and instead of doing a design for it, like if you wanted to make a, a one bit adder or something, one plus one or something, they would send random bit files into the FPGA and they would just test them. So a shotgun approach and they'd find what would add one plus one the fastest. And uh, which... Yeah. The, You know, uh, it might not be too difficult. There's a lot of possibilities, but it may be worth the effort to randomly gem generate 16-byte demos and run them over and over again until you get something. <laughs> but um, I'm going to give you back the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's neat. Um, one of the things that they found when they were doing the randomly generated bit streams is that there was um, behavior that that was unexplained and it was because of the semiconductor process and not because of the logic design that they came up with. They found that they had big ring oscillators where they had all these gates hooked together in a big ring and they were oscillating and generating all this noise on the chip but you know, if you took those out all of a sudden it couldn't add one plus one anymore. You know, so it makes it not feasible for actually production chips but fascinating nonetheless. I'd love to see FPGAs you know, used more in you know, like demos or you know, cracking codes and stuff, because it's perfect for that. You know, if you need to do, you know, 100 multiplies every clock cycle, you can do that. There's no way a CPU could ever touch the processing power in FPGA. Sorry. Um, I just thought I'd ask it. Performance-wise, how does, like, an FPGA compare to, like, a basic stamp or something like that? Well, that's hard to, hard to say, because um, anything you could do in a basic stamp, you could do on an FPGA. But the, um, the difference is you can't do everything on a basic stamp that you can do in FPGA. So you could definitely take your program from a basic stamp and make it sequential and execute exactly the same. You know, be essentially a CPU. You could even make a state machine that does it all. But really the advantage to FPGAs is just doing this parallel computation. Yeah. Uh, the FPGAs are kind of, in, they're inherently slower um, than full custom chips because they have all this overhead of this routing. They have this wire running all over the top and wires notoriously slow in chips. And it has all these pass gates for doing, you know, routing, which slows everything down. So even the fastest FPGAs today, you know, they're in 90 and 65 nanometer um, process. They're still, you know, magnitude slower than what you could actually do in that chip if you did a, a hard, you know, custom design. Uh, have you ever run into um, EM interference from one cell to another in a dense high-speed array? I did some experiments with open um, uh, internal tri-states on an early Xilinx, so you got some interesting effects on that. Um, if you there's not many FPGAs that have internal tri-states, but it's where you can have an internal node and you can turn the, um, have multiple drivers on one node. So you can do some fun things like having dynamic shift registers, which all the early 8-bit computers like Commodore 64s and Amiga used dynamic logic all over it because it was so compact. But I did some experimenting with doing dynamic shift registers where you charge a node and it floats at some level for a while and it kind of decays down and then you come back and you restore it with a flip-flop later. But and nothing I can pinpoint down. I've definitely had designs that you know, were on the bleeding edge of like, well, the synthesis tool said it's not going to reach you know, 100 megahertz and I've ran it anyway and it's worked. You know, and that's you know, because they have very pessimistic... Um, you know, figures in there. So if I would have migrated to some other FPGA, it probably would have died. You know, some made on some other day. Anyone else? Yeah, feel free to come up and talk to me over the weekend, and uh, I might play around and refine this. I'm open to taking suggestions on uh, how to improve it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>